welcome to today's session. Um, my uh, Today's session hosted by the Extension Foundation. My name is Jason Weigel, and I am your host and technical host for today. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and automated closed captions are available. If you need help or technical assistance at any time, please do feel free to reach out to me in the chat. Uh, the copy of today's recording, as well as the slides and other materials that will be covered today, will be sent out to registrants in a follow-up email to be sent out later this week. And so with all that, I'm going to introduce today's presenters. First off is Dr. Amanda Nissimer, who is the clinical, who is a clinical assistant professor with the University of Rhode Island Department of Nutrition and Vanessa Venturini, who is program leader with um, the U University of Rhode Island Extension. I will be putting their full bios into the chat here in a few seconds, and I will also be putting a link to our one-minute feedback form. So if you do happen to have to leave early today, please do take a moment to fill that out and let uh, Amanda and Vanessa know how they did and ask any questions that you might think of along the way as well as let us know what other topics you might be interested in learning more about as part of this or other professional development opportunities. And so with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Vanessa. Vanessa? Hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Venturini. I am a program leader here at the University of Rhode Island Cooperative Extension. I've actually been with the Master Gardener program as our state leader for over a decade now, been with Extension my whole career. Um, but my background's in environmental science, so it was such a pleasure to get to work on developing a brand new program around food waste and food access that we'll be teaching you more about. And I am happy to introduce my partner in all things, including crime and this program, <laughs> Dr. Missimer. Thanks, Vanessa. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming today to hear about our program. This is really a labor of love that we started together right before the world ended. So we're excited to be able to finally share out with everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Missimer. I'm clinical assistant professor in the Department of Nutrition, and I also have a joint appointment with Cooperative Extension. So uh, coupling my teaching and curriculum development with the volunteerism, student engagement, and community involvement um, with both this program, I have a free farmer's market program, and I also have an appointment with FNAP. We're excited to be here. Yeah, and what's been really fun is, you know, we're part of Extension. We are at the University of Rhode Island, which is the smallest state. Um, and I think we, you can actually drive from one end of the state to the other in about an hour. We're kind of like a, a really large county in, in, the, in your state. I see a lot of folks. Or maybe a small county. A small county. <laughs> um, we're called the Ocean State. We have all these wonderful areas of Focus, we're a very small but mighty team here in Cooperative Extension at the university. So this one will do we're all centrally located okay. here at URI. We actually don't have county structure at all. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the same mission probably as you all do. It's so exciting to speak to some of our fellow Extension folks and not have to explain what Extension is. So we'll just move on past that. Um, today, we're going to talk through everything from the development of how this program came to be, what the program is. We'll show you a little video um, to hear from the participants more, some of our successes and challenges. We are going to be very honest. Um, and most importantly, we're very interested in collaborating with you all. Um, and we would love for you to steal any and all ideas from this. What's been really fun for me is I'm coordinating both programs now. So I'm able to kind of take ideas that we tried out with food recovery and implement them with Master Gardener. So I think there's a lot of kind of ideas that aren't just relevant to the program that we developed, but also all extension programs and things that we've We've stolen from ethnic, for example, or that's shared. Good. I mean, that's what extension's all about. Yes, right? sharing. Yes. And we'd love to collaborate with you. So um, our information is in our impact report that Jason's putting in the chat, and it'll be at the end of the presentation and lots of time to chat at the end as well. Okay, so our first question for the audience, and you can either raise a hand if this applies to you or feel free to put yes or no in the chats or anything specific. Uh, Vanessa and I just came back last month from a really awesome extension conference at the University of Kentucky, and so we had the chance to talk to different universities about what they were doing around state priorities. So we want to know what is happening in your state and if you have priorities around the food system in any capacity. So feel free to share those out or raise your hand if it's a yes. Okay. 
Okay, does your state have priorities related to climate change? We hope you do. Mm -hmm. It's a new emerging area for, for extension in general um, in the world. Put a little thumbs up or something in the chat. Okay, next we want to know if you're striving to reach new audiences in your state, if you're building authentic partnerships or creating more inclusive programming through any of the work that you're doing. Throw a thumbs up. Hopefully we give you some ideas for that as well. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you, you all just have your cameras off and you're, you're, everybody's raising their hand. So do you employ train the trainer with either your program or maybe other programs in your state? And so that's that idea of volunteers building the capacity of what they can do in extension through that training volunteers to then be educators and change makers in their state. If not, we hope you'll consider it after learning a little bit more about our program. Yeah, so when we started developing this program, it was really at a time where food waste and environmental impacts were really starting to come to a head in the literature and all these things. So we applied for some grant funding from the Environmental Protection Agency and really worked our program off of their food recovery hierarchy. So hopefully most of you are familiar with this, but a quick run through is you can see at the very top of the pyramid is the most preferred method of how to work with food in our food system. So through source reduction, and then as the triangle proceeds to get smaller, those are from the most preferred to the least preferred method. And as you can see down there at the bottom is our ever filling landfill. So we wanna do our best to hit the different rungs. This was really the driving schematic for this whole course. And we look to teach about each one of these rungs, both from the community perspective and from the personal perspective. So really when we put all of this together, like I said, it was a time where all of these things were kind of converging and those convergences were then ex like so exacerbated by the pandemic itself, specifically with food insecurity, which was one of our original focuses when we wrote the grant, but then it became an even more important part because what you can see here is the intersection, which I don't know, can you see my mouse when I do it? You can see the intersection between um, what we see facing over here with food insecurity, which is when we started this project, our state, which again is really small, we have about a million people, had about a 9.1% of individuals citing food insecurity. And that can be anywhere from food insecurity, which is the actual ability to get food, and also nutrition insecurity, which is the inability to receive enough nutritious food, right? So, and as we saw here in 2020, it was a major increase to 25.2%, but what's really alarming to us and why we need to continue this work is that in 2022, we saw numbers higher than we faced during the COVID pandemic. So there's still so much work to do with this straddling of food insecurity against the excess amount of food that is going to our landfills. So we see about 30 to 40% of our landfill is filled with wasted food and wasted food can be defined as things that are inedible like our banana peels and apple cores, but also wasted food as that bag of arugula that we all buy every week that goes bad in the back, right? So we have to think about that in terms of our landfill and how those two things simultaneously are impacting our world, which is our climate, our carbon emissions, our water usage, all of the things, the space that it takes for us to put these wasted food um, particles somewhere, and also how that impacts people disproportionately through different levels of um, household incomes, skills, abilities, learned knowledge, ancestral knowledge, and how it all relates to all of these things in general. So this is kind of our schematic of all of the things that encompass when we say the word food recovery. It's really an intersectional issue, which is why finding solutions to, to food waste or wasted food solutions um, is also finding kind of alleviating a lot of these societal and environmental concerns, which is what extension is all about. Mm -hmm. And what we've really found through, through this developing this program is 
our role here in cooperative extension is that we can serve as a matchmaker. Actually, if I wasn't an extension professional, I've always told you I'd be a matchmaker. I just think it's so much fun. But instead of with people, it's it's between motivated people who want to do good in the world, which there are so many people out there who were just feeling helpless during the pandemic, and then organizations that are already doing great work in the community, led by community members themselves. How do we bring those folks together to really amplify the work that's already going on? Um, and so that's how kind of one of the philosophies that we came about in terms of creating this program. Um, and so what I wanted to do is start us off with what recipe we used to, um, to develop this program and invite you all to replicate at will. Um, and so we started with an amazing team of uh, our project team, kind of the brains behind what, what started out and um, we had, I think what was most important is we partnered with Nessa Richmond, who's in the bottom left from the Rhode Island Food Council. And they're kind of a network of organizations and individuals that are doing great work. And so she knew a lot of folks and she was able to connect us with other people in the food recovery space, the wasted food space. Um, and the other nice thing was that we were able to bring together a lot, I don't know, if you all feel the same way, but sometimes we work in our silos. Never heard of that one before, right? Um, and so this was really fun that we were able to work across different extension departments. So we like got to team up with nutrition and master gardener and um, 4-H and kind mm -hmm. of bring all of the, the knowledge and information together. Um, and so that's our top right. We have our nutrition, our food safety folks yes, food safety. teaching food preservation. Mm -hmm. Amanda and I in the middle, we came from kind of different worlds. And then um, we even brought in some volunteers who had some great lived experience that they could teach about. And of course, we want to give props to the fabulous Dr. Rebecca Brown, mm -hmm. um, who is a sustainable agriculture professor here and really mentored us through this experience. Um, so you got to have somebody who knows the grant system. And student engagement. Yes. Student engagement. We've had undergraduate students who are on our top left corner there. Uh, we've had so many incredible undergraduate students come through who have helped uh, with as a teaching assistant for the class. They've helped us organize outings. They've helped engage participants. And it's been amazing to have them. We have more and more working with the program. As faculty, that's important for me for student engagement. But it's been a really important, and I think, really beneficial part to have so many students involved as well at the university. Absolutely. And we had paid and four credit students, which was um, mm -hmm. really fun. So we yes. have like the paid student leading the four credit team, which mm -hmm. worked great and we could kind of cycle them through. Um, and then the, the other crucial piece to the puzzle was to engage community partners. So NASA kind of got us started and then we reached out to various organizations. We actually had sub awards to give out through the EPA award that we received to get the program started. And so they received a small amount of funding to either enhance or build an existing project um, or a new project that is around reducing food waste and increasing access to food. And so the partners played many different roles in one. Not only were they leading one of the service projects that our participants would go on and volunteer with, they also served as instructors in the course. So often we would go and visit them and see what was going on in the community and they were sources of inspiration. They connected us to new audiences. So this was super crucial. These were community-based organizations that were already um, centered in the community, they had the good relationships, they were reaching audiences that um, maybe traditionally we had underinvested in as extension. Um, and so we were able to connect with those organizations that we knew would get us in, for example, the capital city of Providence. Um, and so they also led those projects for our participants, um, which we'll talk about later in the internship portion. Um, and uh, so the other piece was, of course, recruiting once we had the course developed. Um, we recruited learners. So any adult learner, any community member, whether they had taken a course with us in the past or they were somebody brand new to Cooperative Extension, um, and they just had to have the will to learn more and then to go out and make some change, whether it's in their lives or at a community level. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other really crucial piece, another thing, feel free to um, borrow from us is this concept of peer educators, which has been really crucial to our success, especially um, with the equity component, has been to kind of 
have individuals from a community organization, maybe they were affiliated as a volunteer or a staff member, they go through the course and then they bring the lessons of what they learned back to the community. So um, Julius C right here is a great example. He led the Sankofa Initiative, which is actually at the West Elmwood Housing Development Corporation. They're this awesome group working um, to kind of bring a localized food system to Providence. Anyway, Julius went through the course, learned about food preservation, and he did an entire pickling and canning lesson with his community members, which was great because they don't want to hear from us some people that they don't know. They want to hear from Julius, who they have a good relationship with, and they're already farming and gardening with. Um, so again, peer educators were a really crucial piece, and in some cases, they received either a financial award, so a scholarship to take the course, and in other cases, they might have gotten a stipend to um, compensate them for their time or just to make sure that they could kind of participate. Um, and we had peer educators from many different organizations go through the course and we can hope to continue doing so. Kind of those built-in leaders to then serve as community change makers. And so really what we're trying to, um, maybe this is the equal sign is community driven change. That whole recipe kind of adds up to this idea of how can we support the change that is happening at the community level with the addition of trained volunteers, with um, some support for ongoing projects around food recovery, with some additional knowledge and information. All right, so what you see here is the overview schematic of how the course works. So this is a six week food recovery course and it is comprised of an online education component and an, a field experience component that builds off of what you learn each week. So for example, if one week is all about composting and different types of composting and what goes into it and you hear from this, that, and the other expert, then you go on your complimentary field experience that week where you yourself learn how to compost. At the end of the six weeks, the graduates receive their certificate of completion, and then they enter into their 40-hour volunteer internship that began with our five original community partners, and now we have even more sites, and they can do um, with one partner or with all of the partners until they reach their 40 hours, and then they are a certified URI food recovery volunteer. This is the mission of our whole program really to come together. And that was a really big one for us, for everyone to come together on these issues that are affecting everybody about food waste, food security, and the environment. We want people to be able to learn something new, engage in a dialogue and volunteer to support our big mission, community-driven change. Okay, now we're so excited to share this video. And I just, before I press play on this, I just want to give a big shout out to the innovation, what was it? ISBE, the Extension Foundation. Yes, uh, Jason, help us. The Extension Foundation. ISBE. Oh, ISBE, ISBE. <laughs> ISV, which is this awesome program that yeah. we went through to help us develop our pitch. And yes. um, thank you so much for inviting us to give this. Uh, I think after they saw our video, they were like, all right, this is something that we want other folks to learn about. So shout out to that program mm -hmm. and we encourage you to take it. We learned a lot, mm -hmm. except for the name of it. All right, ready? Go. <laughs> Food of Food Food Island is a program from URI Cooperative Extension that brings people together to learn something new, engage in dialogue, and then take action to strengthen the local food system. So the program covers a lot of topics. It starts off with something called the challenge, which is where we really identify kind of what I call the bummer news and all the things that are happening across the state in terms of food access and food waste accumulation in our landfills and environmental concerns. From there, it's the next five weeks of talking about amazing community-driven solutions that are already happening across our state and then teaching our volunteers on things like food preservation, they can be trained on things like compost, and also extensive training on volunteerism in terms of equity and inclusion. So, COFA is a local food initiative in Providence, Rhode Island. It consists of a farmer's market, community kitchen, several community gardens, and a greenhouse. Very good. It gives your tenants and residents an opportunity to grow. 
He was covering a road and me and my colleagues that went to the program. And then we plan on taking that knowledge and teaching it to some of our growth and kitchen members so then they can take that and train the next generation. Lifecycle is the community composting program of Brown Birth, Rhode Island. So we're a bug powered food scrap collection program. We pick up from residences and small businesses in Providence. We've done some presentations for the class and then we've been a volunteer host site. So we've had volunteers come do a whole variety of things in groups and individually. Having volunteers who are familiar with like the mission and sort of the organization and the context is really helpful. And also just having consistent volunteers is is really great so then they can get really immersed in the project and be a little more independent and hopefully have a more fulfilling experience as well so what i learned personally is the, that the responsibility that i have regarding food waste because having visited the um, Rhode Island Central Lab field uh, as one of our field trips, I learned we have the responsibility to reduce it and understanding where our waste go. Being a refugee who experienced uh, food insecurity myself, I wanted to explore ways that we can help address it food insecurity and then deal with food waste in order to divert that to feed the people who need it. I've learned how to preserve uh, food through some of the courses that we did, preserve canning, uh, freezing, um, you know, pickling, I mean, you name it. So there's lots of hands-on techniques and skills um, through preserving food that I really appreciate, that I take it home with me. And learn it along with my children as well. So. Our Food Recovery for Rhode Island participants are here in partnership with Hope's Harvest Rhode Island, gleaning food from our changing fields, this amazing farm here in Hope Valley. So Hope's Harvest is one of our partner organizations where your food recovery volunteers can donate their time and help feed our neighbors through this gleaning practice of harvesting food from farms and donating to local hunger relief agencies. It's opened my eyes to really how to make a difference on a personal level and a local level. And I'm recognizing that you can be involved as little or as large as you want. And I just think that's so awesome. It's been a great opportunity to learn what awesome people there are and what awesome work is being done. It's really cool to see what's already happening and how, how you can get really hands on and involved. The power of this program is that people take what they learn, they teach others, and they really live the change. They volunteer in their community, they make changes at home. They're really making this happen at all levels. Thank you all for watching that. I think it's a great illustration of hopefully what we queued up for you. And remember, if you have any questions, we'll get into those in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some links to the video and our impact report right in the chat. Um, and so I'd love to share a little bit more about our various community-led partnerships that also um, are our volunteer opportunities for URI food recovery volunteers to go out and make a change. Um, we talked about gleaning with Hope's Harvest Rhode Island. We were very inspired by this organization. It's one of the, um, definitely our founding partners and one of the reasons that we kind of did this <laughs> program to begin with. Um, another similar organization was just starting out. They had a big chapter in Massachusetts. And they said, we want to start our Rhode Island chapter. And the timing was perfect. Timing is so important for partnerships and collaborations. Rescuing Leftover Cuisine is similar, where they rescue food um, from one organization and donate it to another social service organization. And um, they're similar, where they're, they're matchmaking volunteers. They have this great app where you kind of sign up to pick up the food and donate it. And um, just this idea of how do we get excess food that's still edible and safe to the people who need it. Um, and so we have a lot of our volunteers working with them. 
Uh, community composting has become really um, hot right now in Rhode Island, and there's a lot of community composters popping up. Um, the one that you learned about in the video that we've been partnering with is Harvest Cycle. They're a part of Groundwork Rhode Island. That's a national organization um, that does a lot of job training, and we've seen some really wonderful things come out of collaborations with both Harvest Cycle and then between Harvest Cycle and our other partners, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. We did some really nice zero zero waste. Providence is a completely volunteer led organization that we that we uh, partnered with, and they're out of our capital city. They wanted to see some change happen at all levels of society. So they actually um, partnered up with Center for Eco Technology. If they work in your state, they're incredible. Um, and they did a whole training for restaurants who wanted to uh, do a better job at repurposing excess food. Um, and then they did some youth education as well, some field trips and some collaboration with schools who wanted to do composting and food recovery, um, which is a whole area we'd like to move into more in the future. Um, Zero Waste Providence and then Harvest Cycle also teamed up to get more of these drop-off sites around the capital city and surrounding areas. So libraries, community gardens, um, you either sign up with a subscription to actually get rid of your, your food scraps. Maybe you aren't able to do composting in your own yard um, and you can donate them here. And Harvest Cycle is cool. They're a completely bike powered community composter. So um, these bikes come around, pick up the scraps and bring them to that community compost where we've got volunteers helping out. And um, what was nice is Zero Waste Providence also helped do some of that community outreach and just building the awareness that these drop-off sites existed and that people should take advantage of them now that they've been created. So I thought this was a really beautiful um, kind of piece of public education that went out. Um, next we had, we heard a little bit about the Sankopa at the West Elmwood Housing Developing Corporation. And we heard that from Julius um, where they did a canning and pickling workshop. Um, and now we have even more partners, but those are kind of our original and we are now excited to share a little bit more about what went into the food recovery for Rhode Island course, that six-week course that you saw the schematic for. Yeah, absolutely. So this course was really developed in mind. This course itself, when I was designing it, again, I was doing all of this virtually from literally Vanessa's living room. Um, what we really wanted to focus on was as a university, we acknowledge that we do have research and expertise, but we are in no way all knowing in this area, especially in the community. And so what 2020 and our time at home really allowed me to do was if you look at those bullets at the bottom, when I was designing this course, I was able to gather knowledge from all experts here at URI. A really special thing about Rhode Island is that it's really easy to know everyone, um, often by first name, uh, first name only. And so I was able to gather really everybody who's in this space at URI to contribute to the course. I then reached out to everybody in the governmental space and the Rhode Island community members working in this area as well. So uh, Nessa Richmond, who we mentioned, who works at the Food Policy Council, was really integral in making sure that I was able to be in contact with everybody who could contribute to this course. And of course, everybody was like, wonderful, welcome, excited to contribute their knowledge. Um, we also have a food state policy, a, a state food strategy, and we're one of the food, uh, few states that have that. And actually ours is under renovation right now. So we're going to be coming out with the second iteration of that very soon. And that's really special. So to have people from our government also speaking on this. And then lastly, able to reach out to, we live in a rich area of Native American traditions and have both indigenous and learned knowledge included in our um program as well to sort of encompass everything that is Rhode Island. So trying to make it this whole thing. Uh, we did this through the kindness of others who are willing to share their knowledge with us. And we also were lucky enough to be able to have speakers type in. So some people were able to be supported by the time and the energy that they gave to record things for our course. So this course itself is really aligned with the idea that people can choose what works best for them. So thinking about that food recovery hierarchy rungs and really what rung speaks to you and what you think you can do in the long term, that's both personal and community-based, and that's how the course is built as well. 
so that you yourself are ready to make immediate personal changes and you're also learning how to step into a community and help community-driven change in the same time by blending all of the information that you learn and the skills that you gain from the class. I think what's also was really surprising to us, we had chefs reach out to us. We had this really successful press release go out and we had the local culin culinary college chefs reached mm -hmm. out. We had a, a local meal service say, hey, um, I can give my time and, and be an instructor as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody just excited to help. And so many chefs reached out actually that the personal behavior change uh, project that's embedded in this is actually completely driven by chefs, which is really special. And you learn a lot about how potatoes and onions are not friends and they cannot be near each other in the pantry. So that's, for example, one of the leaks is reorganizing your pantry to best have the longest and best shelf life for the things that you're storing in your home. I love that food recovery challenge. So you get to try everything out yourself. Okay, so this is how the course is structured. As I mentioned, it's about 1.5 hours of online self-paced education, um, a personal change project, and then the actual experience that complements the week's lessons, so to say. So week one is our bummer week. That's the challenge. That's where we face all of the sad facts about uh, the filling landfill, carbon emissions, and of course the rising food insecurity. And now I'm adding a lot for this iteration on rising food costs, which is an area of interest for me and my research. So week one is the bummer news and associated with the tour of the landfill. So we already see what's going on there. Then next week we go to nothing but great stuff from here. So we start with wasted food solutions and that is highlighting all of the incredible work that's being done in farm schools and communities across our state. And we go and see a tour of Sankofa, which we mentioned was this low income housing project that has a farm, a greenhouse, an incredible farmer's market, a, a compost pile all on site. So you can really see it at work. Then three, our third week is focused on inclusive community engagement. So everything from the very beginnings of the definitions of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we have experts from the community teach about that. And then we engage in a dialogue. So practicing for difficult situations or tricky situations and really putting this to work so that we know when we're stepping into communities that we have to be respectful, that we should communicate in these ways, and that we're aware that this is a really important core part of our presence in these communities. Then in week four, this is, I always like to say, I host it at my house because we have it over at my nutrition building, and that's where we teach food preservation. So this is not only uh, taught by me, but also our food safety experts here at the university where we learn pickling and we do canning. Usually we have the produce donated from our farms here on campus. And then I also do some lecturing on how freezing and thawing affects food and nutrition quality. Um, and that's really one of everybody's hands-on skills that they really love. It's a fun one. It's really fun. And then week five, as we continue down the hierarchy, we learn all about composting. So in the online education, different types of composting. And we actually have a compost mentorship program embedded in the course as well. So people can get hours for either mentoring first-time composters or trying to build a compost pile in six weeks during this course. And we see that both on our local scale harvest cycle. And we also have a large scale composting site here in our state as well. They do all the bedding from the zoos. Earth Care Farm. And 40,000 pounds of fish scales. Yes. Ocean State. Yes. And here's the community composter yes. we talked about. You actually get to get in there and turn the compost and not so bad. It's pretty interesting, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and then our last week is really our come together week with volunteerism. So Vanessa does a lot with this on getting ready to do the train the trainer model, which were modeled after that and master gardener and get ready for volunteerism and kind of what that means. And we do a everybody come together gleaning trip. And it's really lovely. It's so nice to be out on the farms and all talking about everything and getting ready to step out there into the community. Yeah. And I think we invited past participants to this. Yes, so it was did. fun to kind of have people who had gone through the course with yes. new people. Um, anyone who does volunteer management or programming knows that the social component is super important oh, yeah. and crucial. So you get to keep people engaged, keep them interacting with each other. I mean, some people stay involved in things because they finally found their people who care about bringing the banana peel home from vacation yes. <laughs> or they finally found their family. We always ask that. We're like, who's brought compost home from vacation? <laughs> I dropped it at the compost site where I was. Just That's always fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when they actually have it on vacation. So here are our successes and you can see these on our impact report. That's I think LinkedIn, the chatter was sent out, but I mean, 
just so many incredible testimonies. Um, over here, you can see that prior to participating in this course, 43% of people planned or began volunteering. And by the end, that had doubled to 81%. And here you can see all the rungs of the food recovery hierarchy and from participant understanding from beginning of the course to the end. So you can see that in every aspect of the food recovery hierarchy, we saw improvement and knowledge gained, which for the course in terms of education is what we wanna see. And now after taking the course, 62% will plan and 18% actually began to volunteer. So we were ready to go. We're successful. And our, our boss likes to say that this is where community development comes in, where people are actually making a difference. In yeah, absolutely. Because they have the education. Now it's time to train. So in the interest of time, I'll go pretty quickly through this. Sure. But again, you can see it all in our impact report. Uh, these are our numbers for how much food was diverted from the landfill. 190,661 pounds worth really exceeded our goals. Um, and next, you can see how much food was donated to feed people. That's through our rescue organizations. We started and continue with five community-led food recovery projects, and we have 120 trained volunteers, and that have contributed over 988 hours so far, and growing and, and counting. counting. <laughs> uh, we were also able to calculate the environmental impacts, which are calculated here. So uh, everything put together was the equivalent to 17 passenger vehicles and the amount of CO2 emissions that were mitigated along with 13.18 million gallons of water that was saved through composting, 20 Olympic swimming pools. There we go. Here's uh, again, looking at the ability to volunteer, the want to volunteer from beginning of course to the end doubled. And we do have a quote here, I recognize where I can make an impact and feel empowered to make a difference regarding food insecurity and food waste. Doesn't get by me. It's as it. good as it gets, right? It's as good as, it, good as it gets. We went through this peer educator model um, that we can read about that again in the impact report. And our final quote before we get into... Oh, I thought it was interesting. We actually here. had undergrads go through the course as well as mm -hmm. adult learners. Graduate students. Graduate students. And what yeah. was nice is sometimes the undergrads could then work on our um, project team as well. So definitely keep students there incredibly talented. Keep them in mind. From every major. It's amazing. We have had so many different majors. Caroline was from sociology. We're actually partnering with a philosophy class this year. So it really spans much beyond just the people you would think would be interested in this. It's a lot of people who are really, really interested. So keep the students in mind. Oh, I wanted to share this. This was really exciting. So I get to sit on um, the Rhode Island Food Policy Council has working groups. And there's always been this one kind of going in and out of how popular and active it is. Well, right around the time that we got, uh, that we finished our program, all of our partners joined this Wasted Food Solutions work group. And um, in the course of a year, two pieces of legislation were put forward to the state legislature, um, which are now being kind of reviewed and, and thought through. But I thought that was a huge accomplishment that not only are we looking at change in behavior and knowledge of our mm -hmm. participants and those who learn from our participants, but even changing condition where we might see some policy change around um, one is expanding our food waste ban, and the other is actually providing more incentives for people and organizations to donate food, giving a state tax credit to do that work. Um, so hopefully we see some of these come mm -hmm. into reality. Mm -hmm. um, we did want to share a few challenges. Everybody has challenges. I was just remarking to Amanda that we forgot to write COVID-19, but we did change our plans. and we're I said we're optimistic, so that was never a challenge for us, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We were optimistic, yeah. <laughs> but, but we all know how challenging that yes. time was. Um, and I think we originally thought, especially through like Sankofa and the West Elmwood Housing Development Corporation, that we would get community members to go through the course and get them stipends. It ended up being more uh, faculty member or sorry, staff members mm -hmm. of that organization who ended up being the peer educators. Um, it was a lot more difficult to engage community members given time and resource constraints. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that uh, I'll just be frank and honest about with our peers here of extension folks and um, is that we did see some interpersonal conflicts, which I was surprised mm -hmm. um, sadly about among our participants. And what I'll say about that is that it, it uncovered a need for more um, training for ourselves and our fellow extension employees around interrupting bias. So if you're facilitating a program and you 
see an incident happen, you know, how do you step in and when, what's the proper way to do so? And kind of even just modeling that behavior. We just did that in the volunteerism extension conference. It's one of my favorite mm -hmm. uh, professional developments, but I've been seeking that since these happened. Um, and beyond that is we're now in this phase of looking for funding beyond the pilot. We think it was really crucial that we gave those sub awards out to mm -hmm. our partner organizations. Yes. We'd like to continue doing so to support their staff and efforts around this work. Mm -hmm. um, and also provide stipends for participants in terms of um, making sure that those who um, have been underinvested in by extension are able to participate in programs like this. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also a lot of opportunities for future directions that we would love to chat with you all about um, through the end of this. One is creating more culturally relevant content, so really digging in deeper to what kind of information we're sharing around mm -hmm. food preservation and uh, maybe some immigrant refugee folks talking about what they've done, you know, and brought to Rhode Island or some of our indigenous partners. Um, we want to also maybe cater our curriculum as different areas arise. We talked a little bit about school systems and how everything's different in a school system. And we want to make sure we have Well, folks, I do believe we lost our presenters. Hopefully they'll be back on here in a second. So while we're waiting for them to come back on, and if they're going to come back on, I'll do some of my closing stuff here so we can get that out of the way and hopefully spend some more time talking with our presenters. So uh, if you have it, now might be a good time to help or to fill out the one minute feedback form. Uh, let Vanessa and Amanda know how they did. Uh, and it might be the opportunity to ask them questions. I know there were several questions in the chat that we didn't get to yet that I was hoping that we would get to. Uh, so if uh, we don't, Abby, we will definitely make sure that your two questions get answered in the chat. Um, and then also, this is one of the one of the three different um, professional development opportunities that we offer throughout the Extension Foundation. Uh, the first one, this uh, program center stage highlights different programs throughout the extension system and hopes or helps to try to make connections between the different programs to bring them together. Um, <clears throat> the other, oh, thank you, Nancy. The graduate of the program and can't say as to cost, there is materials cost, but there are also scholarship opportunities. Thank you for that input, Nancy. Very much appreciated. And then Lisa, oh, you're still here, Lisa. Good. <laughs> you can help uh, field some of these questions perhaps too. Um, and so the other two programs that we have are extension skills and dynamic discussions. Extension skills is just what it says. It's about skills that we use in our day-to-day -day work, then uh, new tools, techniques, and different types of things that we can implement in our day-to-day -day activities. And then uh, the last track that we have is dynamic discussions where we take a topic of one type or another and explore the dimension, different dimensions of it. And so uh, feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. Um, I will definitely make sure to snag those if Vanessa and Amanda aren't able to get back in. And then it looks like Lisa and Nancy are, are uh, two Co-co presenters here are helping to answer those questions. Nancy mentioned that the schedule is flexible to allow for people who work full time. 
Excellent. Yeah, Christine. So it looks like, um, and I'm not sure if if the two people, the couple of people who are on this this see, this feels a lot like the Master Gardener program, a very uh, uh, a kind of a shorter Master Gardener program where it's not just an educational class, but it's a class where the goal is for them to stay on and to to volunteer and to kind of be um, kind of proactive in their in their community. It's not just a class, is that right? So Amanda is yes, and we're Vanessa. Here. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. How fun was that? That was like circa 2020, right? Keeping you in suspense. Sorry so about the, the question. Yeah. Did you catch the question that was asked? I think so. Yeah. So it's both um you a train the trainer. So you learn and then you do a volunteer internship in the community. So we have partner organizations that you'll then volunteer with. Was that the question? Yeah. So, so again, I, cause I was looking at the price and the price is it looks like it's $300. Is that right? Yes. Um, but it's again, for me, it feels like you're, you're not just taking this class. You're really hopefully committing to, to being a community advocate for food recovery. Yes. Essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got it down. Yeah. It, it sounds to me like it might be a really good to like, it could be sponsored. I mean, that's, it's, I mean, that's not, it, it is, it, it seems like a lot of money, but if it could be sponsored by your business or your organization, right. So if employees could have that be part of their professional development, I don't know. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Our master gardener course is $500 for yeah. comparison. So I know our prices are different in Rhode Island than other parts of the country. Yeah. Well, that's, what I was saying it's similar to like a master gardener program. Um, so, okay. Right. And I would say, Christine, that that's working already well, too, with uh, I have an appointment, as I told you, with FNEP, and that's coupled with our SNAP Ed office. So mm -hmm. our SNAP Ed director has offered to pay that um, amount for any of the SNAP Ed educators who want to go through this program. And then they can also I think there's some stuff that they can count as their work hours as well, some of it. So they we already have been working with them. So I definitely think the sponsorships love that. from other companies is things that people would be open to doing. And we also do have financial awards built into our budgeting process yes. so that um, folks can apply for those who are in need. Um, and thanks, Nancy, for the shout out thanks, in the chat. Nancy. Amy's asking if there's a continuing education. And yes, we are continuing to engage our volunteers. Mm -hmm. We were just thinking through what kind of, you know, reward would, and Nancy, maybe you can comment on this, what reward would people want when they finish their volunteer internship? And we're thinking of more of an experience where we all get together and do like a potluck and do some apple harvesting in the fall or something. Right. Apple harvesting. We did a backyard chicken session, which was really, really fun. And I also have a kimchi session in the works as well. Right. So we're trying to have the continuing ed be like the carrot to keep you involved. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the benefits. Continuing with both the education and the skill. So you always will do both. And um, we are very open to collaboration. That was one of the things that we missed on our last slide. And we would love to hear the rest about your next steps. Yeah, workforce development was the other framing that we really wanted to kind of look into because we realized a lot of the people taking our course were doing so as networking reasons. So you heard um, a little bit from Melissa Coletta, who, who took the course, she was kind of picking the eggs out of her backyard. One of the pieces that didn't end up in the video is that she actually ended up, um, she works for a beautiful day granola company that serves refugee populations. And she brought her refugee youth to do workforce development with the community composters. She brought them out to do gleaning. So she was able to kind of create connections and partnerships through her, her career, as well as her personal life. Um, which was an unexpected thing. And we think this could be great for professional development. Professional development, I also think workforce development too, because there are several um, community partners throughout the state. Like I'm thinking about the one with the newly released inmates to learn how to garden and things like that, that we're talking about partnerships with. So definitely space to grow there. Yes, and the school areas and another place that where we have a lot of action going on in the state and um, they're looking to scale up. So they're saying there's only X number of us who are staff that are providing consultation to schools. How can we maybe train volunteers who mm -hmm. can then 
reach all the schools that are asking us for assistance with food recovery in schools. So um, a lot of different areas where this could move. We've talked about um, partnering specifically with food pantries mm -hmm. to make sure their volunteers and employees can do like demonstrations mm -hmm. as people are doing their pickups. Um, how, do you, how do you make the most of your own food? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, we're really interested. We do. There are master composter programs, master food preserver programs around this country, um, and we're really interested in this idea of combining them all and maybe um, looking at a national collaboration, looking at multi-state, um, you know, programming and and grants. So please contact us if you're at all interested in that. Yeah, okay. if you want to run this in your state, I'm happy to put together the materials to share or chat with you about it. Um, like I said, ours is extremely Rhode Island specific. I designed it that way, but it the ideas themselves are right there to lend themselves to what your state is doing. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Feel free to either um, on Email mute, us. on mute, yeah, or unmute. put it right in the chat. Yeah. So yeah, I did my closing stuff, so we can dedicate the next seven minutes to answering okay. questions. So folks, uh, do feel free to open up your mic or type it into chat. There were two questions that were uh, posted in the chat while you were presenting, so I do want to make sure those get covered first. Uh, so when you were on, uh, Amanda, when you were on the course principles slide, mm -hmm. uh, you said something that made Abby Gold ask, is that a food charter? I'm sorry, a food what? Charter. I don't know what a food charter okay. is. I, I think he, you talked about having a statewide food Oh, priority. the food strategy. Yes. Strategy. Yes. Yes. We have a state. Food <laughs> can you put it in there, Vanessa? It's called Relish Roadie. And I think Amy's on here. Amy, if you want to share it out too. Uh, Relish Roadie is our state food strategy. It was developed, I think, in 2018, somewhere around there. That was the first one. And we are one of the first states to have something like that. So it's really looking at the whole state and, you know, its priorities like X amount of food should be produced within Rhode Island by this state. And um, we have a really big seafood Thing. As we said here, we have 400 miles of coastline, so lots of seafood. So priorities around engaging our local seafood and having that be part of it. So it's all in an effort to have Rhode Island be a more food system, sustainable and friendly state. I think it's so, more of like a statewide strategic plan. Yes, I would call it. Yeah. That, that's a good way to put it. So if you look at our relish roadie, that's the old one. And then right now, Julie Stelmazic, who is our uh, person in the government who's heading this up. And like I said, I think, oh, there we go. Lisa's got it up Thank there you, for Dr. us. <laughs> um, she's going to be working on updating that. And we're bated breath. My, I can't wait to read. I'll read it like Christmas morning when it comes out. Oh, yeah. There's, we're really interested Thanks, in Amy. food systems in this state for sure. Was there another question, Jason? Yeah, uh, Abby also asked, do you teach lacto-fermentation? We don't, but that would be definitely something that, I, I post videos about all these things. So I usually have like my core curriculum and then I have the extra resources page for people who want to try more because we do get a lot of people in the course who are either familiar with pickling and canning or they're quite good at it. So then they are looking for that next thing. So I'll post additional resources and then we'll give like extra credit or extra hours if they want to try doing those things. But um, we're not doing that yet, but that's all in the idea book for continuing ed. Yeah. And we'd love to connect more with some of the folks who have master food. Yeah. If you've got server. it, call us. Yeah. We'll try it. We'll try <laughs> anything really. What won't we try? So uh, next question that I see that didn't get answered at this point where it sort of kind of did, uh, is this curriculum available to other extensions to use? Uh, we were actually just talking about that. I'm not, I, I don't have like a current packet that's like a shareable format. It's something that I would love to create. I could certainly talk you through it and we could figure out how I could share it with you. We're on Brightspace, which I know is like not as popular as some of the other um, learning management systems, but that is something perhaps we should talk with the Extension Foundation or another foundation about creating something that I could hand over more easily in a package that it could be replicated because my absolute dream is to see this replicated. Yes, and please reach out if you're interested in that. The more interest we can demonstrate, the more potential uh, funding we can find to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you advertise the program to get people signed up? That's where our community partners came in handy. They mm -hmm. sent it out through their own um newsletters newsletters emails. social media was really important social i love media. doing social media instagram and facebook um ads so we do that we are 
actually advertising our next program. So we'll be running this again in the fall. We're going to be asking all of our current volunteers to share with family and friends because um, I'm putting it in there. Hold Keep talking. Word of mouth is kind of our, our strongest advertisement. Um, we do have a, a great food recovery for RI Instagram mm -hmm. handle. We encourage you to follow. We um, are actually going to be doing community flyering, going back old school, asking our volunteers to help with that. Um, what else? Answering Julie's question about the dedicated website. Yep, we have yes. a dedicated <laughs> website for understanding like just the components of the course, but then the actual course itself is hosted on a learning management, a learning management system called Brightspace, which is similar to Canvas or Blackboard. So something along those lines. And I'll um, share a secret. Senator Reed's office helped us share our initial um, uh, press release. And so, of course, we had to mention him this time around and give him a look. So we're hoping he'll, <laughs> they're going to help us share as well. Any other thoughts or questions? I know we've got the one minute feedback form. Thanks, Jason, right in the chat. Do we answer everybody's? So yeah, call us. What day do you do site visits? We do on Wednesdays. Wednesday evenings or sometimes uh, Saturday morning. So mm -hmm. we try to make sure that this is available for folks who want to still work and people from all stages of life, and you actually sign up for your field sessions because we'll have multiple um, at the time of registration mm -hmm. so that we can maybe hold some during the day, some in the evenings, that kind of thing. So then I usually open the course like week by week, and I usually open it on Sunday so that people can start doing their education and reading through the stuff so that by Wednesday they could be as prepared as they'd like to be for the field session. Thanks everyone for being here. Oh my gosh, Christine, can't wait to talk to you. Yes. <laughs> Call us. So yeah, thank you, Amanda and Vanessa for presenting here today. We very much appreciate it. Uh, as I noted to everybody, thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for being here. As I noted in the chat, we'll be sending out the contact information for both Amanda and Vanessa. So do feel free to reach out to them if you are interested in bringing this program to your state. Uh, we will also be sending you uh, a copy of today's um, presentation or the recording, as well as uh, links to the various things that were provided in the chat here uh, during the question and answer session. And so with that, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you all for being here today. Again, thank you, Amanda and Vanessa, for presenting. And hopefully we'll see you at a future um, one of our professional development programs. So have a good afternoon and a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.